has come for the story as J.R.R. Tolkien has always envisioned it. Here is The Hobbit. Take it away. All right, welcome everybody. Uh, this is The Hobbit based on the book, not the movie. Um, our runner here is uh, Crix, and uh, I'll let the couch introduce themselves. Sure, I am Kerf Murph. I'm Author Blues. I'm Tina Hacks. All right. And as he already said, I'm Crix. All right, so uh, I think with that, uh, we're ready to count it in, if you guys are ready. Uh, so I'll give a countdown in three, two, one, go. Woo! And for this high octane speed run, we're gonna start off with 16 and a half seconds of load. It's a good time to get your stretches in. This is good. This is the content I crave. <laughs> so we'll talk a lot about the movement in this game a little bit later, uh, because there's gonna be a lot of time to talk about the movement. Um, but what most of this speed run is going to become is for the vast majority of the stages, there is some location in the stage that loads the end of the level. And so we're just trying to get there. Crix has actually managed to get out of bounds almost immediately in this level. It's meant to be a very small, short tutorial. Uh, he got out of bounds and found the end of level trigger right there. So that is one stage down, 12 to go. <laughs> There's our tutorial. <laughs> Woo! You've learned everything you need to know about playing the game. Yeah, it turns out that that was just um, Bilbo's dream. So now he's actually back home and uh, he, ha he has to power up. So we had all of our weapons already. Uh, now we have to get our weapons. Yeah, it's like the beginning of a Metroid game, basically. I did jump over the table. You the jumped table. over the table. Woo! Most speedrunners are afraid to jump over the table, but <laughs> Crix, uh, Crixburg is a different level of dedication to this run. The, um, the movement of the camera might feel a little bit I don't know, nauseating. Um, <laughs> but a lot of this is really intentional. This game suffers from some, you know, usually when we here at GDQ talk about glitches, they're almost always favorable. We say, you know, I, I learned this glitch, I did this glitch. Uh, a lot of the glitches in this game are bad glitches, <laughs> negative glitches, if you will, um, like long jump glitch, which is where sometimes when you long jump, uh, which is necessary for skipping large portions of the game. Uh, the game just decides you lose all momentum in midair. And there we go. It's really best seen when you're over a pit or water. Um, we're going to see a lot Often of that. Often both. Often both. Yeah. Each of these stages usually has a lot of um, mandatory missions. Some of them have uh, optional missions, but most of them have mandatory missions that further the storyline. So for instance, in this one coming up, uh, the trolls have stolen his wallet, I think, and they have to go get it back. Um, but again, what it really comes down to is once you got done with all those missions, you were just gonna have to walk to the end of level trigger. And so we're going to find that trigger, even if it happens to be out of bounds. Yeah, there's like a very deep meta game going on where uh, originally in the book, Bilbo was very reticent about joining the party, but uh, this is a very AU kind of universe for The Hobbit where Bilbo is just completely game for everything. <laughs> yeah, very much an Aaron boy. So uh, that skips... <laughs> Quite, quite a lot of game. I don't know. <laughs> how else am I supposed to word this? We skipped a lot of game. Two minutes. Um, Optimally. Yeah, so, so Crix is going to go for a pretty tough trick here that um, most people don't really go for. It's really temperamental. There's not a really great setup for it. Um, there's a lot of level here, but it turns out that the end of level trigger is actually right behind us to the left. Um, so if he Ooh, can get that was past cool. these these uh, adorable horses, then we can actually just end the level instantly. You may see a theme uh, starting to appear. Don't worry, we'll kill it off in the next level. They know what they did. <laughs> so he's choosing a, a slightly different option here. That uh, clip he was trying to do right at the beginning is extraordinarily temperamental. This one's a little more straightforward. Which is not saying much. Yeah. I have forgotten how to jump attack. This is a, a very frustrating clip as well because uh, you have to actually make the distance first, so you are subject to everything that comes with that. Plus, you have to get the attack at the right time. Nice. Yep. 
All right, so we're now past the horses. Yeah. And that's it, yep. right there. A lot of these end of level triggers would make a lot more sense if we went through the level in the right order and things would load. Uh, there was just nothing there because we had never loaded what was actually supposed to be there. This is um, probably the worst level in the game. So it's fortunate that's pretty early on. Um, it's very challenging um, just by virtue of the platforming in it alone. And in addition to that, it also comes with the downside of being one of two levels where we mostly play the level as intended. So whereas all these other levels, we were able to go out of bounds and just find a level trigger and be done with it, this level we pretty much have to do as intended. This level also has one of the few actual instances of RNG. Uh, it's very unlikely that we'll see it, but a little bit later there's going to be some lightning strikes. And once in a blue moon, you will actually get struck by lightning and just instantly die. Man, you said that out loud just now. <laughs> So Crick's uh, long jump into a uh, cutscene trigger right there um, because it actually extended a lot lower than it needed to. So uh, little time saves here and there. There's a lot of really subtle movement that's going on here. The constant slash uh, jumping, plus any time he's going somewhat downhill, he long jumps. Uh, he's going nice out of his time. way to avoid cutscene triggers. There's just a lot of really subtle you things going on. For me. <laughs> that's my favorite quote in the game. <laughs> It's a top 10 Bilbo quote. Turns out you can actually just fly through ropes by holding down the B button. It's faster and exactly one rope, and that's the rope. So and now you get to see how long it takes to save. Yeah, he's going to be taking a few safety saves here and there. Um, in, you know, a really, really optimized run, we wouldn't see a lot of those, but for reasons like this... <laughs> <laughs> Not lightning, but a RNG rock. Yeah. It's, it's good behavior to save once in a while. Um, so we'll we'll see a handful of saves throughout the run. He's got a few stages where he's going to be taking one or two saves throughout. It doesn't cost a ton of time to save. It's it's inconvenient, so usually you wouldn't see it. But for a marathon run, it makes perfect sense. So we touched a little bit about just the basic movement mechanics. To go a little bit more in depth on them, uh, long jumping that you've been seeing a lot is the fastest form of movement when you're moving downhill um, or from any sort of higher ground to lower ground. Uh, if you're moving on flat ground or moving upwards, it's generally going to be better to do that slash jump because a slash is going to give you forward momentum, uh, but at the very end of a neutral slash, it stops your momentum. But if you jump, you can maintain that going forward. Uh, another thing he's going to be doing is long jumping into a lot of these uh, ledges that are like maybe head height, and that's just going to allow him to grab onto them faster. Everything he's been doing here has been to get all of the pieces necessary to assemble a gearbox just to open a door. Um, and this is the only one he's going to have to assemble. There's actually a few more of these um, throughout the stage where they would uh, lower bridges in order to allow him to continue. But coming up uh, is... Um, a, a pretty tight jump over water, challenging to perform. Uh, so we're going to see that coming up here really soon. Yeah. It's called yeah. Bean Island for reasons that will soon be apparent. This is a, a really good safety save right here because this is a, a really temperamental jump. Sometimes you get the angle just right or you get the timing just right and it feels like everything's going to line up and then some piece doesn't, doesn't land exactly where it needs to. Perfect. Okay, that, Perfect. That's, that, that jump looks really harmless, but this game is very fickle with the movement. Um, sometimes you'll miss it because you didn't get the timing right, and sometimes it's just by no fault of your own, you just miss it. So we're getting pretty close to the end of this stage. Aside from skipping those two gearboxes, I, I think more or less we've done exactly what's expected of this level. Um, the only part left that's really to skip is there's a little fight scene that you're supposed to encounter coming up where Gandalf kind of helps you fight off uh, a bunch of enemies. But Thorin and Gandalf are up here, and this game has an interesting quirk where if you can talk to an NPC, they warp you to a specific location. So he's going to try to get high enough to be able to talk to Thorin, and it's going to warp him uh, further through the level than he's supposed to have access to. So there right you there. Go. And so now we can end the level. Twenty-three seconds.
Boy, I wish this loading screen were over. <laughs> this is the fast loading option. Yeah. That was almost as hard as jumping over the table. Now I kind of miss the loading screen. Yeah. It's always there for you. It's consistent. <laughs> no damage. So we're heading down into uh, this series of mines, and the whole point of this stage is to uh, get to the other side and end up finding um, Gollum and the ring. So this is where we're first going to get the ring. And the ring does have um, some power and mechanics in this game. Uh, this is a relatively straightforward level with a little bit of clipping out of bounds um, that will help mitigate some of the more obnoxious parts. And we're going to see that coming up in just a moment. I love how the intense music just pauses for a moment. <laughs> So this is a really easy clip out of bounds. Uh, you just slide along that wall. And even though those two um, rooms were very close to one another, uh, they actually represent a very large difference um, distance in, in gameplay. There's a lot of uh, mines and machines that you have to assemble and fights you have to do to get this far. The mine Looks like this is the way so this is a pretty basic mine card. You just have to hit the three uh, switches here. Um, only funny thing worth mentioning here, and it's not going to matter in this run, but uh, if you get a run past this level and uh, you have to reset for whatever reason, uh, then you actually have to reset your console because the game will remember the last position that those switches were in. So when you hit them to face right, if you don't reset the console, they will still be facing right even though they're showing left. Also, if you exit the game while you're in the minecart, then the game does not let you switch any weapons, so you have to reset because you can't get past Troll Hole. It does a lot of fun things like that. I would just like to point out for anybody keeping score that in 11 minutes and 51 seconds, Crix has done more than Peter Jackson did in three hours. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> so this level uh, is pretty much entirely out of bounds. Um, and that's by design, this, this stage actually has a lot of fighting to it. There are several mini-boss fights, uh, some of which are more substantial than others. Um, at the top of the screen, you can actually see his experience meter. And the way you acquire more max health in this game is by leveling up by killing enemies and fighting bosses and completing missions, which he has done none of. Um, and so he still hasn't even gained his first level yet. So he still has only three uh, health units. And <laughs> there's... It's, it's irresponsible of him to go into a fight this underpowered. Not to mention there are four of them in this level. Yeah. Uh, any one of those fights would be too much for him to handle at this health, and he would have to do four of them uh, back to back. So he stays out of bounds. Um, some very specific movement that may not be obvious that he's doing that is helping to continue load the level. Um, as with a lot of 3D games, only part of the level is loaded at a time. So some of his movement that may seem unnecessary or him going out of his way is, are specifically to hit these load triggers so that more of the stage will uh, load in as he continues. But you can see massive holes in the stage where you know he's just not hitting all of these triggers so it's not loading the way it's supposed to. You can hear the music playing as if he is fighting something. Well, he is right now. He's, He's fighting, fighting this wall. wall. Fighting yeah. this wall. There we all go. All right, nice. Backups. Yeah. So now he's just going to hop around the this outside. This completely normal. <laughs> this is how it was in the book. This is actually pretty precise. So. Yeah, this one, this one is a little harder to navigate. That's it. All of this hill looks mostly the same. Uh, he just needed to long jump into an end of level trigger. That was it. That saves what six minutes because of the boss fight. Yeah, it's uh, not 
insubstantial. Um, 27 seconds. This is the other level we had mentioned being more or less uh, played as intended. This is our Metal Gear Bilbo level. <laughs> um, we have gained the ring, which gives us the mechanic of being able to be stealthy, and we are infiltrating the elven base in order to free the dwarves who are imprisoned here. I should mention my controller is special. I've been using it for so long that the Z-Trigger, which is the ring button, no longer works properly half the time. So this is going to be a very interesting experience. So there's probably a good few minutes here for uh, for donations. Um, he just needs to collect some items and do a few block puzzles, but, but now would be probably a good time for a few donations. But of course. Have $50 from Quantum TM. Shout out to Crix for getting the best speed game ever made to a GDQ event. It's been a long time coming, but I can't think of anyone better to show the world how awesome The Hobbit is. P.S. Please remember to thank the Stone Giants for making your escape for you. On a related note, $10 from some dude 1316. Thank you, Stone Giants. You've made my donation for me. <laughs> Shout outs to Stone Giants. And prepare yourselves for this one. We have $20 from James127, The Hobbit. I Shire wouldn't want to miss that. With this much fun, nobody could look Gollum. At the risk of sounding smog, I think I've got all the relevant puns handled. Welcome to the Late Night Crew. Does someone want to cover the crystal skip real quick? All right, $10 yeah. oh. from Holmesy McGee. Much love to the runner and the couch from the official Hobbit cheerleaders in Virginia. Uh -huh. Thanks. So uh, he actually needed to collect three elven opening crystals in order to uncover all these pedestals. Um, but he can actually skip one of them because it turns out that this last block, as long as you get it close enough uh, to this pedestal, it counts. So... <laughs> This stage has this, it's really easy for this stage to go wrong. Anytime you're discovered by an elf, and it's very easy to get discovered. It's not just a matter of your ring running out, but it's also if you get a little too close to them. Uh, brushing up against them gets you caught. Making too much noise gets you caught. Uh, if, your, if your ring were to run out, it gets you caught. So there's a lot of ways for this to go wrong. So this is a good stage for a few uh, safety saves. In their dwarvish racket. Dwarvish racket. <laughs> I love the dialogue lines in this level. I love the dialogue lines in this whole game. Did he ask you to trim his beard? That's an actual line. <laughs> so what's going on during this part? part? I actually don't know... Uh, the reason why we're running around this stage in the way that, that we are. Sorcerer has plagued this land. Uh, well, the, I guess, mechanic of it is that uh, throughout this whole level, what he's trying to get are these four keys, uh, these door opening crystals. Um, they're scattered all over the place. He picked up one at the very beginning of the level. Uh, basically, everything he's doing is to try and unlock triggers to obtain the others. So right now, he's going to get the third one, mm -hmm. correct? Yeah. And Welcome to in-level load screen. <laughs> now they're not just at the starts of levels. The fourth one, though, is the fun one. Yeah, so this is probably the time to start setting up a glitch that we're going to be seeing pretty soon. And it deserves its own explanation because uh, it's really going to be a very pronounced element of the rest of this run. And so you kind of want to know what you're seeing. Um, so the glitch is made up of two pieces. This game is a 3D game where you can occasionally get caught up on geometry once in a while. And so the developers of this game had a really clever idea. And the clever idea was it keeps track of the last safe location you've been in. So what that means is, is any time you're running on the ground for a certain amount of time, that amount of time being a full second, the game says, this place looks safe. It doesn't look like there's an issue with Bilbo standing here. And it records that location. And so you can actually keep track of a safe location by jumping a lot. And when you jump, the game can't update your last safe location. 
The other part of that is that there are some locations in the game where you can get yourself caught on a wall in such a way that the game thinks, oh no, something's gone wrong, and I need to warp them back to the last safe location that we found them. And so this sets up a glitch that we refer to as clip warping. Uh, so what Crix is going to do here is he's going to walk to a very specific location, and he's going to walk on the ground for long enough that the game says, this place looks safe. And then from that point onward, he's going to jump constantly. And that jumping is intentional. That jump is so that the game does not update that position. So he sets it here, and then he's going to turn around. And from here on out, he needs to get off the ground uh, at least once every 60, 60 frames, so every one second. And he's going to get himself caught on a wall here so that the game clips him back there. And the reason why he wants to do that is because now that he's in this room, that other room is unloaded. So now he's walking into this room completely unloaded. All of the geometry out here has been uh, unloaded, and it allows him to just jump straight out into the void to collect an item that's out here. I don't know how that angle worked. I don't know how it worked either. And now he's right back where he was. Slight optimization there. I was actually able to set my clipboard farther back into the room so I didn't have to walk all the way back. So that's a pretty cool trick on its own. This next level... Um, I think is a testament to how so many different glitches come together. I think a lot of people talk about glitches in games, and you look at a game that's really broken, you think, how did it get to this point? How did a game, how did someone discover all of these things and put them together? And I think this game is actually a great example of that idea. Can uh, I just throw in shout-outs to David, by the way? Yeah, for sure. Uh, so David is, is one of the uh, glitch hunters for this game and, and has done a lot of really great work for this, so... Uh, definitely shout outs to MD Pi. Um, I had to mention that specifically for this level because he's basically the one who created the route that we we're about to show you. Yeah, this level used to be a lot longer and a lot harder. So it's important to understand what we're seeing here. Uh, the first thing that he's going to do is exactly what we talked about before. He's going to set his safe location to this spot over here on the other side of this bridge. And now for the foreseeable future, he's going to jump. Just constant jumping. And it's important to remember that uh, that 60 frames that I talked about also counts times that you're in cutscenes, you're in dialogue, anything. So right here, he's talking to Bard. He has to get off the ground as quickly as possible because those 60 frames counted there as well. And he's going to start a quest called the Thief's Quest, uh, where there's this thief that's sort of patrolling around Two, the town. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. This is intentional, I promise. <laughs> so he gets himself stuck right here. And now he's actually managed to be on the other side of this bridge. He shouldn't have access to this area until the end of the thief quest, but he can come here a little bit early, which is very helpful for setting up the next part of this trick. So the next part of this trick is where it gets really zany. So he just jumped right over the water, and I guess this must be like an iceberg off in the distance. It's just too dark to see or something. So he's going to line himself up about where those boats were to the right, and a little bit beyond this, uh, this water wheel to his left to set his clip position there. So now he's going to make his way all the way uh, back to where we warped at the uh, end of the thief quest, and he is going to basically just bide his time there until the thief, who is now completely invisible, just a ghost of his former self, uh, he's going to show up eventually without us knowing when. Nice time for donations, by the way. Yeah, so uh, he's going to... Um, yeah, there's a little tough part he's going to have to do here right at the end of this, where he has to uh, fade out and dismiss two entire cutscenes all within 60 frames. If he can do that, he will keep his clipboard position that was out there in the water, and he was actually hovering right above where the end of the level trigger is. So we've got a minute or so if you want to throw in a few donations. Well, yeah, I can do that. We have... $150 from Inc. 149. Staying up after a long day packing to watch my childhood favorite game get destroyed. I am so, so sorry you have to do the entirety of Overhill and Underhill, but at least those stone giants made your escape for you. <laughs> Good luck on the rest of the run. This is the warehouse. So he's going to go inside this door in just a moment, which is going to unload the entire outside um, and then clip back to that spot, which will allow inside. him to fall down into the other copy of this level. 
So if he did not lose his clip position at Bard, then we should just see a blank void and then the end of the level. And there we go. Perfect. Perfect. This is um, another level that used to be way... That it's not fair to say that this level got easier because it absolutely didn't. It uh, used to be a long level and a difficult level and an annoying level, and now it's all those things except for long. We used to play elevator music during it for reference. Yeah, uh, so this level is made up of two pieces. The first piece is where you are sort of um, entering into Smog's domain, and he plays this... Uh, sort of stealth game with you where he is firing off these blasts of dragon fire while you're hiding behind things. And then once you get past that, then the real auto-scroller begins <laughs> where you have to ride an uh, a, a door on water as the water level excruciatingly slowly rises. Um, if you've ever seen the ending of Titanic. <laughs> <laughs> as it turns out, though, that second half of the level is unloaded out uh, to the left of us right now. So Crix is going to clip out of bounds and attempt to, not easily, but attempt to long jump out to the end of level trigger. This is probably the hardest one. Yeah, so just to explain how these walls and triggers work a little bit, there are basically three zones uh, behind this door. So there's a first zone that is a fade out. And the fade out, once it fades you out, puts you back behind the door. Behind the fade out trigger, there is then an invisible wall that is going to block you, um, which he just hit right there, which caused him to die. And then behind that invisible wall and just kind of hanging a little bit under it, I don't know how to exactly yeah. represent it, but this is basically the invisible wall. This is basically where the end level trigger is. So you have to fall and then like slash jump at that at a weird angle. It's very difficult. For what it's worth, Crix actually taught us all how to do this with his wonderful MS Paint skills. <laughs> um, perfect. There was. What was that, fifth try? That's not bad. That is not bad. I think my world record is like sixth or seventh, so. That's Your a... real world record or the fake world record? No, that's the real one. The one I won't acknowledge. <laughs> yeah, that whole stage all told is probably how many minutes, would you say, doing it the intended way? Mm, seven. Seven minutes? Glitchless. Yeah, you can do that level in probably under a minute if you do it first try, everything perfectly. So that's the thing. Um, None yeah. of this is intended. <laughs> I feel like at this point in the run, we don't really have to say that sentence. But there's some puzzles you're supposed to do around here so that you can get up to the second floor, but just use the geometry dummy. Yeah. This is the one place in the game where just walking is actually the fastest form of movement. And yes. I don't really know why. Something about walking against this slope just makes you go real fast. It's a nice chance for him to relax his hamstrings. <laughs> if he's getting a hamstring workout from this run, I think he's doing it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, coming up, there's, there's this second area around the corner that's going to get loaded, and the previous area we were in is being unloaded right now. Um, but the actual end of the level is right by the Arkenstone, which is sort of through a wall over there in that area he just looked at. Uh, why did he just look at that, though? He just looked and left. I wonder what he's about to do. <laughs> Shoutouts to Bilbo's cape. <laughs> so this is that room he looked at. Now it's unloaded, and so he has to just long jump to this uh, stone right there in that room. And That's he did. it. One more stage. Twenty-seven seconds. Oh my God! They just get longer. <laughs> Woo! Is this the longest load screen? Um, no. Okay. Wait, yes. Wait, no. <laughs> Wait. Well, I'll get he's back figuring with you on it that. out. So, what's <laughs> happening in this stage? Uh, there's a, 
There are 11 missions in this stage, and they are all mandatory, so we're going to do about half of them. Um, the first and probably most important mission that we're going to see is we're going to encounter our good friend Corwin that we saw in an earlier level, except for we skipped it. Um, <laughs> And he is going to get into a fight with a bunch of orcs who do not like him very much. And we have to save him, so we are not going to save him. <laughs> so we come down here to load this area properly, as, as the Lord intended. And now we just get to watch Corwin slowly die. Yeah, so we are now on the clock. If Corwin dies before we unload the area that Corwin is standing in, uh, the level ends. But actually, if he makes it out quickly, if he makes it out quickly, then Corwin actually becomes immortal. And we forever have this meter at the bottom of the screen to remind us of our old friend. Yeah, pour one out for Corwin. Uh, his health bar's at the bottom of the screen. Um, in memory of Corwin. <laughs> I believe this one's 11 seconds. <laughs> Thank you. These are all taken out in post run, by the way, on our leaderboards. So here he needs to clear a path by um, launching a barrel using this catapult. And you're supposed to have to do some pretty, some, some platforming to get up to it. Uh, but he's just going to slope boost up to the barrel and activate it. These guys are I the hate worst. These guys. Oh. these guys are the worst in the game. I haven't it's, saved. Yeah, it's pretty random whether or not they they even bother to attack you. Is um, that two minutes now? Well, we get to resurrect Corwin just to watch him die again. <laughs> I could show off the other Corwin this route is, this time. This is his hell. It's not that much slower. <laughs> Are you going to try to do the uh, inactive fight skip? Yeah. yeah. So uh, the version that Crix did just now is actually the fastest version of that strat. Um, well, I, I guess it's arguable, which is faster. It's just two different options here. But uh, he did what we refer to as active fight skip, which is where we make the fight actually start, and then we get out of there as quickly as possible before Corwin dies. Um, I think Crix is going to go now for the inactive fight skip, which is where you load the area in a very specific way, such that Corwin is there and the orcs are there, but they seemingly don't notice each other. <laughs> That seems better for everybody involved. It does, but as you can see, it takes a little more work to line it up. Yeah. This is a really good strat, by the way, if you're just learning the game, because while it takes a little more time to line there everything up, the two of them aren't supposed to really notice each other. Oh, hey, look, I still loaded the meter. Sometimes the meter loads, sometimes it doesn't, so. This is good. We get to be reminded of our good friend that we abandoned forever. <laughs> See, previously he was on death's door, but now he's, you know... He's living large. Ready to father yep. a family. <laughs> Corwin has his whole life ahead of him. What is it that I said last time? 13 seconds? 11? Did it get longer? <laughs> I don't know. We're going to save this time after I do the barrel. Yeah. Yeah, ha. <laughs> now that I saved, it's 100% guaranteed that the goblins will not kill me. They won't even notice you. Yeah. <laughs> well, you cheated. You put on the ring. <laughs> you stacked the deck in your favor. Of course, the game still tried to kill you with long jump glitch there. <laughs> What goes around comes around. So this is when we uh, meet our very good friend, Bayorn, uh, the bear. Um, he really wants to get on the other side of that bridge because if there's one thing he's good at, it's killing orcs. So you're supposed to do a lot of platforming around this whole like river area, but you can actually just, you, you know, Kobe that whole thing right there. Yeah, one well-placed rock is enough to mess up their entire day. 
So he's trying to stay somewhat out of bounds here so that we don't load the Bayorn fight. It's not really a big deal if the um, if the fight between the Orcs and the ba and Bayorn starts, but it warps you down to where that fight is happening. And he wants to stay up here because this whole game has really just been an effort uh, to talk to our good friend, the Barrel. <laughs> um, Forget everything you know about The Hobbit. This entire game was centered around just... Time ends when we talk to the barrel, by the way. Talk to the barrel. So three, two, one, time. And now our favorite Rube Goldberg machine. <laughs> now we get to watch the most ridiculous chain of events take place. Just as it was written in the book. And boom. By the way, you need to kill all four of these goblins to save Bjorn. <laughs> Just kidding, you only need to kill one. What was the time on that, by the way? 34.06. Not bad. That's very good. Yeah. That is, in fact, nine minutes faster than my PB. So this is The Hobbit. It's, it's seen a lot of changes over time. The world record has changed hands. Honestly, Crix has put in so much work into this game and deserves uh, a lot of respect. He has put more time into this speed game than most people have put into any speed game. Um, and it really shows with how consistent he is and how the strats have evolved over time between him and David uh, working on this game so much. So. Oh yeah, by the way, our good friend Thorin died. Yeah. We only talked to him once. He doesn't get better? <laughs> oh no. Oh. Skip. <laughs> Oh yeah, and like I said, all 11 of the quests in the level are required, so we did five of them. <laughs> well, that's The Hobbit. Thank you, everyone. That is The Hobbit, everyone. <laughs> Boy, this Hobbit credit music is really bumping. <laughs> Let's hear it again for Crix for that fantastic run of The Hobbit. everybody if you are just joining us be sure to stick around this is summer games done quick 2019 and coming up we have tony hawk underground 2. if you haven't seen this one oh boy are you in for a treat and speaking of tony hawk underground 2 we actually have a bit of a bid war for this one and not much time left so uh, i'm sitting here staring at this bar graph and um y'all really seem to like shrek let me tell you uh, Shrek here has a commanding lead at $1,014.20, so uh, fans of Purple Robot Wizard or Pro Skater 1 Tony Hawk trailing at 102.50 respectively, so um, somebody once told me that if you want any of these others to win, you have to keep those nations coming and they don't stop coming, and they don't stop coming. Try the veal, folks. I'll be here all week. But enough about that. Let's, uh, let's hear a little bit about what you all got to say here. 
We have $5 from Vicarious Vice. Hobbit? More like hop it, am I right? Who needs the power of the One Ring when you can just jump out of bounds? Also, shout outs to the late night crew. $50 from PA Master 115. What's up, Couch? It's your cool pal Emily. Much love for a good cause, and it's good finally seeing The Hobbit with some timely skips past all the detailed Tolkien narration. Yo, all there about that. Let me tell you, if that book were as short as that run was, I think I would have enjoyed it a lot more than I did. We have $250 from Gravity Pike who says, The Hobbit was my favorite movie as a child. This is uh, something else. <laughs> Good luck, runners. $20 from Lizzie Pangeli. The Hobbit has been my favorite game since I was a little kid, and watching it being played at GDQ makes my heart sing. Good going, Cricks, and best of luck on the rest of the run. I am pleased to report the luck was, in fact, excellent. <laughs> we have $200 from Hey It's Pixis. Greetings from Middle Earth, more commonly known as New Zealand. AGDQ and SGDQ are my two favorite marathons, and I couldn't resist donating during The Hobbit, of all things. I did the best I could, Pixis. Hope that's, <laughs> hope that's satisfying. We have $100 from Call Me Butter because I'm on a roll! <laughs> I'm glad that the audience has at least some of people who appreciate dad jokes. $50 from Captain Schmo. No donation comment, but thank you so much for your generosity. All right, since I'm seeing the, uh, the Underground 2 character select kind of... All right, my friends, we're going to uh, see a quick Twitch ad here, see what our friends at Twitch have to say. We'll be right back on the other side. Stick around.
And we are back. Did you miss us? Because we certainly missed you. Still getting Tony Hawk ready here, so let's go right on back into your donations. We have $50 from Meeper. Once upon a time, there was a little ogre named Shrek who lived with his parents in a bog by a tree. It was a pretty nasty place, but he was happy because ogres like nasty. It's been, it's been a while since I've seen the movie, but I'm fairly certain that's true. Oh my god, this is Superman. Getting flashbacks to the warehouse all over again, shoot. We have $50 from Dan P. Thompson. Every event, I try to up my donations. This one is no exception. GDQ always brings me so much joy, and I'm so happy to know this money is going to the MSF. Thank you, runners and staff. $25 from Cal13. Gotta always donate during GDQ. Let's go, Doctors Without Borders. Let's go, SGDQ. says the middle of the night is low energy time and nah, peak speed run hours. <laughs> we have $50 from Demogoros, fourth year watching, first time donating, glad to finally be able to. I just want to say how much I love GDQ because it proves that when gamers come together for a cause, we can achieve some truly wonderful and amazing things. $20 from Mad God Rando. Been watching GDQ for a while and always donate. It's for an amazing cause and I love watching all the speedruns. Shout out to the crew working behind the scenes to make all of this run smooth. Oh boy, my friend.